Catholic leader. He was a religious man and he managed to combine everything despite a complicated, obstinate personality. He has an honored place in history for three main things. One was that he uh, led the revolt for four years against the British before the um, independence of Israel was established. He was elected as Israel's sixth prime minister and in that capacity, the third is that he won the Nobel Peace Prize for signing the historic peace agreement with Egypt, with Anwar Sawat. When he died in 1992, Israel and the Jewish people lost one of its greatest heroes. Okay, so let's hear a bit more about him. And although you do know a lot about him, I hope you will hear some stories that you don't know. If I when you have read Prime Ministers, this book, um, I did, of course, get a lot out of that. Menachem Wolfovich Begin was born on the 16th of August in 1913 to Zevdov and Kassia Begin in Brisk, which is now Brisk Litovsk. It was then a part of Russia. He was born on Shabbat Nachamu, which is an occasion for comfort and hope. He was the youngest of three children, and he always had the desire to restore Jewish independence. His father had influenced him a great deal. His home was a religious one, but an enlightened one. His father's legacy was one of Jewish pride and nationalism and commitment in action. He was one of the community leaders. He once bravely clubbed a policeman who was anti-Semitic and was cutting off a rabbi's beard in public. In another incident with Mordechai Schneerman, who was the grandfather of Ariel Sharon, he broke down the door of Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik's synagogue in order to have a memorial service for Theodor Herzl, despite the fact that the rabbi insisted that there would not be one. Begin never forgot his father's courage and bold acts and always said of him that he never knew a man more brave. The family had been fairly affluent. His father did a lot of traveling as a timber merchant and he knew a lot of people and held prominent roles in the community. The family was forced to flee in the First World War but returned to Brisk afterwards, which was then part of Poland. Hard times hit them and they were often hungry and very poor. Once at his Polish high school, he failed a Latin exam because he refused to take a test on Shabbat. He remained religious throughout his life. He kept kosher, took his kippah everywhere with him, put on to fill in every day. And as prime minister, he walked to Anwar Sadat's funeral, which was held on a Shabbat. In 1934, he gained a law degree from the University of Warsaw. In the 30s, he was active with Betar, having joined the Betar youth at 16. He was a passionate Zionist and made a speech even then. It was about Bar Kochba, who also influenced him. Betar was the Jewish Zionist revisionist movement founded by Jabotinsky, who was a model for Begin for his whole life. Jabotinsky had warned the Jews of Europe in 1939 that they should all leave they should leave the Galut, otherwise the Galut would liquidate them. Of course, his many people just didn't listen to those prophetic words, but Begin was moved by his teachings. In 1939, Begin became the head of Polish Betar, which was one of the most influential positions in, um, in Polish Jewish leadership in Holocaust Europe. It had 70,000 members. Begin said that Jabotinsky was not only their leader, but he was their bearer of hope. When Jabotinsky died in 1940, Begin took over that flame. He was just 24. He concentrated on military training, foreseeing that the need to defend Polish Jewry. At the beginning of World War II, Begin encouraged the emigration of thousands of Jews to Palestine, yet precisely at that time, the British had closed the doors. Begin never forgot that, just as the Holocaust began and the British were crushing all their hopes of salvation. In 1939, he married Elisa Arnold, 
And in 1940, they were intended to go to Palestine, but they had to flee to Vilna, which was in Russia at the time, and where the Soviet secret police arrested him for his Zionist activities with Betar. He expected to be caught before long. The story goes that he was playing chess with his wife, and as he was dragged out of the door, he exceeded the game to her, making her think he would be back after a short interrogation. However, he remained in detention for a year and was then sentenced to Siberian labor camp for eight years. He spent nine months being tortured in Siberia and suffering tremendously, by, also by Polish anti-Semites. His spirit never broke through that, and he tells the story in his book, White Nights. He thought that Eliza would despair, but she sent him a handkerchief with the letters OLA in the corner, which was a secret message. His friends helped him work out that it meant she'd gone to Palestine on Aliyah. He was released in 1941 because of an agreement between Poland and Russia for all the Polish citizens and who were imprisoned. And he soon found himself a member of the Polish Free Army in exile. They then sent him to, in 1942, to the Middle East via Iraq. And so he met up again with Elisa. But sadly, he learned of the murder of his parents and brother at that time in the Holocaust. And thereafter, for his whole life, it was based on his passion about the independence of Israel, but greatly influenced by the Holocaust and the effect upon him. Every decision he made was influenced by these two things. He contacted the dormant underground group Irgun, and, and he assumed command of them and reorganized it. The extent of the Holocaust was becoming known and the Irgun broke away from the central Zionist policy of restraint. It became a source of enmity for years between him and Ben-Gurion who had hoped that diplomacy would enable the eventual independence of Israel. Begin drafted strategy manuals, obtained arms, and the Irgun in 1944 declared the Jewish revolt against the British occupation in Palestine. He wrote a book called The Revolt about this. The British tried to hunt him down absolutely relentlessly and offered £10,000 reward for him, dead or alive, which was a lot of money in those days. But he succeeded in outsmarting the British army and the secret police by a series of disguises, the most famous of one being as an orthodox rabbi and hiding in a modest flat in Tel Aviv. And he would move around to other flats. All this time, Elisa supported him and also their son, Benny, was born. The Begins also had two daughters later on, Hassia and Mia. In attempts to crush the Irgun, the British turned to floggings and hangings but the Irgun also matched these as they got more and more determined. Among the most famous of the violent actions was the blowing up, of course, of the British headquarters, which was in the King David Hotel in Jerusalem in 1946, in which 91 people were killed, including British, Arabs and Jews. Begin maintained that warnings were given in time for people to get out of the hotel but the warnings went unheeded or hadn't been heard at all. They didn't reach those intended. Warnings were given for every attack they made and Begin always referred to himself and the Irgun as freedom fighters and not terrorists, but the British called him a terrorist. He was the biggest terrorist they were trying to get hold of to get. Definitions do change. What's the difference? If you are fighting for your independence, are you a terrorist or a freedom fighter? That's a topic for another day. The Akko prison break in 1946 was another famous attack. In that one, it freed scores of the underground prisoners from a fortress-like prison. These exploits, along with the larger Haganah and the Lehi armies, caused worldwide sensation, and they didn't do much for the British either. Eventually, these things forced the British, they got fed up with the mandate and were forced to withdraw after having sought the advice of the UN. As you know, the UN had um, 
proposed a partition in November 47, and then on the 14th of May 1948, the independent state of Israel was declared. The militancy of the Irgun had brought Begin into conflict again with Ben Gurion and caused an ideological, political rift and a personal contact conflict between the two for many, many years. After all this, the underground forces united, forming the IDF, Sahal. During the time that it took all these months for this to happen, a very unfortunate incident to happen. You probably remember the boat, the Altalina, which had been ordered by the Irgun and it was coming with arms for them and it also brought many, many volunteers to fight for the state of Israel. The ship was approaching land and Ben Gurion had felt that it, it was a threat to democracy and the threat to the army and it looked like there was going to be an army between, uh, uh, within an army. And although they had reached an agreement, it, um, Ben Gurion asked the ship to um, to give all the to unload all the all the weapons to the IDF, uh, but the people on the ship refused, and so Ben Gurion issued the command to fire, and the ship was shelled. Um, Begin was on board that ship, and he he obviously didn't want to return fire because he would have lost all of the um, arms, and he also had many men on the shore who he could have asked to fight back, but he did not because the last thing he wanted was fight a Jew against Jew. And he, com he com coined the term, Milchemet Achim Lo, a war among brothers, never. There were 16 deaths and many injuries. And despite those consequences, he did avert a civil war. Later, when asked what had been his greatest achievement in his life, he said that in his whole career was this incident of which he was the most proud the outcome otherwise of civil war would have been unforgivable for him, Jew fighting Jew. At that point, Begin turned to politics and formed the Kheirut party with some Irgun colleagues. It was based on Jabotinsky's ideals. Begin contributed to Israeli democracy by forging his party into a very tough but loyal op opposition to Prime Minister Be uh, um, Ben Gurion's ruling Labour Party. Ben-Gurion excluded Begin and the Kherut party and the Khomeini party from every coalition that he had headed. He believed that Kherut and the communist parties were a threat to democracy. Kherut wanting a right-wing dictatorship and the communists a left-wing one. But that was far from the truth. He never understood that Begin followed Jabotinsky's teachings of a liberal parliamentary democracy. Only much later, 16 years later, in 1967, on the eve of the Six Day War, after Ben Gurion had retired from political activity and Levi Eshkol was Prime Minister, Menachem Begin joined a delegation which visited Ben Gurion and asked him to return to politics, to the Premiership. And after that meeting, Ben Gurion said that if he had then known Ben Begin as he did now, the face of history would have been different. Begin was famous for his brilliant speeches and often provided drama in the Knesset as well as high standards of performance. In the 50s, he led the movement against the reparations agreement with West Germany. He really couldn't bear the thought of dignity being restored to Germany simply by paying a one-off for the lives that they had taken not so many years before. And then later, after the Sinai campaign of 56, he led the opposition against withdrawal from Sinai. He wanted peace, not territory there. In 95, he merged his Kherut party with a liberal party, which was the, formed the basis of the Likud party for later. In May 67, on the eve of the Six Day War, Begin was instrumental as part of the National Unity Government and served in a cabinet as minister without portfolio. In peacetime, he was a fierce opponent to the ruling Labour Party, but he took the view that um, in times of emergency, it was very important to support the country's welfare and security.
For three years, he was part of the decision-making body until a disagreement over an American peace agreement prompted his resignation. It was the Rogers um, Agreement, which was about handing back territories in the West Bank. Above all, Begin felt that these were part of Israel proper and would never be returned. He held that view always. Under Begin in 1973, the Khairut party again merged with several smaller factions and formed the Likud party. And on May the 17th, in 1977, Likud defeated the Labour party for the first time since Israel had been established. And surprisingly, Begin became the sixth prime minister and served for six and a half years. His leadership style was far more formal than his predecessors were. His first thing was he told the Knesset that his main aim was to avoid a Middle East war. Enough already. He asked the presidents Assad and Sadat and also King Hussein to meet with him wherever and whenever they wanted and where they chose. Too much blood has been lost in this area, Arab and Jewish, he said. Secret meetings were soon organized between Israel and Egypt. And in November 1977, President Sadat came to Israel for a full stage reception, one Motzei Shabbat. It was in a little bit of a secret, but that's when he came. Both countries were still officially at war, but the agenda was towards peace. Golda Meir came out of retirement and attended that reception too. After 15 months of really tough negotiation, the Camp David Accords were signed on September the 17th, 1978. It was not an easy path and called for Israel's withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula and the establishment of Palestinian authority there, or autonomy there in exchange for peace and normal relations with Egypt. Many Israelis were against this, but Begin really felt it was the only way to achieve peace. There were some important difficulties the talks were mainly about Egypt, but the West Bank kept coming up and it was getting a bit difficult. And in the end, President Carter stepped in and the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty was signed at the White House lawn on March the 26th, 1979. Begin, who had fought for independence in the 40s, showed the same kind of determination in struggling for peace in the 70s. It is said that he was very tough on minutia, I guess that's his legal training, whereas Sadat stuck to generalities. The press was pretty hard on, on Begin, and new documents have since come to light recently showing that Begin was not quite so difficult as the press had portrayed him. In December 1978, Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. It was Begin's most outstanding achievement can I just show a, po a photo or something? Yeah. Can you give me, um, can you let me share? I want to see if I can. David, are you host? Okay, it doesn't, it's not important. I've got, I've got plenty to say, don't worry. So it doesn't matter. Um, it may yeah, not I'm work not, not hosting, uh, but my black is, so. Um, yeah, yeah, don't worry, it, it, it doesn't um, matter. Just um, allow you. It may not work. Oh yeah, Irene. Irene, can you hear me? Um, yeah. Irene, um, I've just allowed you to. I don't know if I can do it. Anyway. You can. Sorry? You can. Just press on your. Oh, have you? Okay. I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can. Okay. Oh, there you are. Oh, is it working? Wonderful. Yeah. Yes, it's working. It's working. Yeah, I know. I just want to see if I can do it. Okay, this is a picture of them signing the. Um, This is the, signing the uh, the accords. Um, I have another well, photo of the three it, of me. them on the lawn with Menachem Begin dressed as he is there, and the other two in t-shirts and and slacks. But Menachem was never seen not dressed in this way, and he said he had to. With he was with two other premiers. Tell, I'm going to give him that and then this because then when this is in order. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to give Okay, the next, the one I want to show now is um, he wrote um, as part of his, um, he 
he gave a lecture when he won the Nobel Prize and he wrote some beautiful things, not this. Um, he first opened up his speech by asking for permission to pay tribute to Golda Meir. And that was really lovely. He was, she was the only person that he mentioned, only prime minister he mentioned. And he wrote some nice things about Israel. He stood humbly with pride um, as the winner of the Nobel Prize. And he spoke about the Jewish world um, having the vision of eternal peace and disarmament, abolishing the teaching and learning of war. And he quoted, um, and they shall beat their swords into plowsheds and their spears into pruning. This nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And this is, I think, a very beautiful thing. Peace is the beauty of life, it is sunshine. It is the smile of a child, the love of a mother, the joy of a father, the togetherness of a family. It is to the advancement of man, the victory of a just cause, the triumph of truth. Peace is all of these and more and more. And he also um, mentioned that it was the anniversary of um, the Declaration of Human Rights. And so he, um, he wanted to remind everybody that it was the 30th anniversary and that we should remember that not everywhere in the world um, was it taken up and he, he wanted it to be. That's how he ended his speech, which I think was really very nice. Okay, um, another facet of his life at home was that he was a scholar. He was a self-taught scholar. He spoke eight languages, English, German, Hebrew, Yiddish, Polish, Russian, French, Spanish, and he knew Latin. He loved history and Tanakh. After he became prime minister, he organized Tanakh studies every Motzei Shabbat in his home and invited prominent rabbis and teachers. At one meeting in 1981, he mentioned his admiration of Joshua as a military leader. At the time, he was also serving as defense minister as well as prime minister. And he said that Joshua's success lay in his bold, imaginative and unpredictable strategies. Two days later, Begin ordered the successful air attack on Iraq's Osirak's nuclear reactor just outside Baghdad, just before it would have become operational. Although world leaders condemned this action, Israelis thanked their prime minister for his courageous decision. Later, it would seem that the whole world was grateful. Maybe by being inspired by Joshua's action, showed Begin's ability to meet the challenges of our time. His view was that no Arab country should have nuclear weapons. On the domestic front, Begin also achieved much. He will always be remembered for helping to bridge the gap between Ashkenazi and Sephardi in Israel. He opened up doors of opportunity for citizens. Up till then had felt like second class citizens. He wanted to give right, he wanted to make right the injustice. Also, he introduced Project Renewal, whereby Jewish communities around the world, as well as in Israel, joined the war on poverty and neglect in the poorest neighborhoods and development towns and rebuilt them. In Israel, he truly wanted to improve and beautify the towns and cities of the 60s, which had at the time been put up very quickly because of the mass immigration. He also intensified the national campaign for the right of Soviet Jews to come to Israel. He also initiated the movement to rescue Ethiopian Jewry, and that led some years later to Operation Moses and successfully culminated in the Operation Solomon. Another story. Once the government had raised the prices of basic foodstuffs like bread and milk. Bacon came home for lunch every day and that day he came home and the Ozeret said to him that this would seriously be difficult for many of the nation's poor, especially those with, heart, with large families. So that same afternoon when he went back to cabinet, he reversed that and cancelled those price rises. He did listen to the people. Bacon was re-elected as prime minister in June 81 and soon afterwards came the problems in Lebanon yet again. There'd been problems with Operation Litani in 78. 
Terrorist activities soon hit Israeli towns in the Galil and targets around the world. Katushka rockets fired from Lebanon hit towns and villages, and in June 1982, Israeli troops invaded Lebanon in Operation Peace for the Galilee and aimed to destroy the PLO infrastructure there, thinking it would be a short-term operation, but it grew into a protracted conflict. This war did achieve some goals and an Israeli security zone in South Lebanon was set up, which ensured years of peace in the area. But a high death toll of Israeli soldiers happened. 600 were killed and about 3,000 were injured. The price was considered by many in Israel to have been too high. The conduct of war was also questioned. There was an internal inquiry held. On top of that, there were the massacres by Christians in the camps of Shatila and Sabra. This greatly upset Menachem Begin and weighed very heavily on him. In November 1982, President Reagan invited him for summit talks. At that time, Elisa, his wife, was very ill, but she seemed to improve a bit. He didn't want to go. She convinced him to attend this meeting. While preparing to address a gathering in Los Angeles, Menachem was informed that Elisa had died. He was very upset that he hadn't been with her at the end. And less than a year later in 1983, on September the 15th, he resigned as prime minister. He just said, I can't go on. He was deeply affected by the death of his wife and also the loss of life in Lebanon. He really said he couldn't do his job. He lost his fighting spirit and he lived in seclusion in his modestly furnished apartment, only going out to visit family and to see Elisa's grave. He died of a heart attack in 1992 at the age of 78. He had chosen in his will not to be buried on Mount Herzl like the other prime ministers, but, on the ancient, but in the ancient cemetery on the Mount of Olives, which overlooked the old city. His funeral by request was simple with no official ceremony. He chose to be buried at the side of two of his Irgun comrades who had died in the revolt against the British. They were murdered. But tens of thousands turned up to his funeral as he was so admired. The funeral ended with relatives and former colleagues singing the Betar anthem, which closes with the words, to die or to conquer the mountain. The words poetically express the values of sacrifice and determination, the love of Israel and Am Yisrael, and the commitment that Menachem Begin lived up to. Just want to tell you that there is a new film out. It's a documentary about Begin called The Upheaval, and it's being premiered at the De at, at, in Denver at um, a film festival, which begins tonight. Um, it it's, was made by um, a musician called Rem Bashani, who really felt a debt to Begin because he grew up um, and he felt the benefits of Project Renewal. He grew up in Rishon Lutzion, which was one of the cities that was rebuilt. And he said if it hadn't been for Begin, he wouldn't have seen the beautiful city that it became. And also he wouldn't have become a musician. And he, he talks about the life, it's a documentary that it, 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 go, it traces Bacon's leadership and all the things that he stood for. And there's been a lot of revivals recently um, about his style and so on. And with the new peace deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, there's another reason to look back at Begin's new light. If one goes to the Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem, you can learn a lot more about him as well. So there we are. He was a proud yet scarred leader, haunted by the Holocaust and decades of war. He had struggled to balance history with heroism to make peace with his greatest enemy. He was brilliant, he was tough, he was complex, he was loving and a proud man, and he never compromised when he felt that the survival of Israel and the Jewish people were at stake. 
God, I want to show you a few quotes of his to end off with. Here, you can read them. I come to Jerusalem, there the sky is blue and the memory becomes clear. So these were the, some of the things- Can you said. double click, please? Double click? What do you mean? Your uh, attachments are not opening. Oh, it's on my screen. It did open. Is it, hasn't it opened for anyone? No, it's not opened. No. Oh, no. okay. Well, mine is, so I don't know what to do. So I'll just skip it. Okay. Um, I'm stopping the screen share. Okay. Um, I think um, I think you've got got the picture of what kind of a man he was and um, the legacy that he left. So thank you very much for listening. And thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, I don't know. to uh, add anything or ask any questions. Uh, Offer anything? Ask anything? Add anything? Oh, you've got your hand up. Yes, I can say that um, when, when uh, Begin made peace with um, Egypt, he, he stressed that uh, Israel has to make peace from strength, not from weakness. And um, that's persisted. And um, we've now got peace with several Arab nations making the Abraham Accords. And I'm sure that all goes back to the time of um, David's comments that, that we should make peace with strength and, and Israel's strength in the world, not only militarily, but um, economically is all part of the reason why other countries now really want to be friends and to do business with Israel. Thank you. Very good. Can I just add something? Because he once clashed with Biden. I just thought I could mention it. Can I say it? Okay. Um, I discovered that Joe Biden and Begin once clashed in 1982, um, and it was in a private session with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The subject was about Egypt, but Mr. Biden, who was 39 at the time and just entering politics, he lectured the 68-year-old Begin, who was at the end of his career, and he brought up the Israeli settlements in the West Bank, very hot point. And he jabbed his finger at the prime minister and banged his fist on the desk. And Mr. Biden warned that eroding support for, the, for Israel would threaten US aid to Israel. Israel, in the meantime, was also at war in Lebanon and far more dependent on American assistance than it is today, than it is now. However, Bacon replied without hesitation, don't threaten us with cutting off aid to give up our principles, Time magazine. Bacon went even further. I am not a Jew with trembling knees, he reminded Mr. Biden. Uh, Mr. Biden. There's been a lot of law grown up around that and they, and, and they have said also that he, he continued his response by saying, I'm a proud of 3,700 years of civilised history. Nobody came to our aid when we were dying in the gas chains and ovens. No one came to our aid when we were striving to create our country. We paid for it. We fought for it. For it. We will stand by our principles and defend it. And when necessary, we will die for them again, with or without your aid. Of course, we don't know exactly what was said in the closed session of Tim Willey. It was live being told the press release. So there we are. <laughs> we'll see if that comes back <laughs> in the near future um, when, uh, when uh, President Biden's in our ways gets going. <laughs> um, that must have been around about the first time that Joe Biden ran for president, wasn't it? Okay, um, any more questions or comments or anything? Can I? Oh, yeah, be sharp. Yeah, quickly, please. Okay, I uh, You told us that when Begin was a young man, either in Poland or Russia, he organized um, military training for the Jews. Presumably that was illegal 
because I should imagine the Russians wouldn't or the Poles wouldn't allow it. And therefore, also, is it a precedent for other Jews in countries worldwide today? Well, I said that he concentrated on... I can't hear you. Things, oh, sorry. I didn't mean that he organised... I didn't say that he organised military training for us. I think he did. Your move. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to if I didn't no. say that, but I don't think I did. I said he concentrated on the training. Okay. Right. On which note? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Irene, thank you very much. Um, we now move on to our last Jewish giant. Um, Frank um, is going to tell us about uh, Colonel Ilan Igozi. Um, Colonel Igozi was born in 1944. He's a multi-decorated hero of Israel's wars and is currently the executive director of the Zahal Disabled Veterans Fund. So, Frank, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Irene. Um, I think I probably much prefer to have gone first tonight and been the warm up act rather than having to follow you. Uh, but I'll do my best. So thank you, Irene. Um, thank you, David. The title of this, of this whole series of talks has been Anshay Midot, People of Stature, Jewish Giants Who Have Made a Difference. The majority of the giants that have been spoken about in this series have been steeped in Torah and committed to Torah learning, to Torah teaching. And when David kindly asked me if I'd like to join in with this series, I looked at the giants and it occurred to me that there were, on the one hand, the household names, the people that have been spoken about in recent weeks. But on the other hand, there are so many non-religious giants, so many anonymous giants who have made such a huge difference. At the very beginning of Pirkei Avot, in chapter one, Shimon the Righteous, Shimon HaTzadik, teaches that the world stands on three pillars. He says it stands on Torah study, the service of God, and Gemilet Chasadim, the performance of kind deeds. The person I'm going to speak about tonight, retired Colonel Ilan Igozi, has probably performed more good deeds, more kind deeds for his fellow Jews than anyone else that any of us actually know. And by doing this, he's also performed an heroic Kiddush Hashem, a heroic service to God in saving so many Jewish lives and making one particular mitzvah available to so many Jews the world over. There are actually, I think, three mitzvot that have to be done with the whole of the body. The first one is mikvah. The second one is sukkah. And the third is living in the land of Israel. And whilst Ilan Egozi may not outwardly be a religious man, it's through his actions that thousands more, just and the actions of thousands more like him, that today we have the state of Israel, and that today Jews the world over continue to make Aliyah. Ilan has knowingly or unknowingly facilitated this mitzvah and made it available and attainable for all of us. So who is Ilan Egozi? What did he do? I'm guessing, having had a quick look through the list of participants, there's probably only two other people online tonight that have ever heard of Ilan and that know him, um, and that's Jane and Dave. Um, Ilan is married, three grown-up children, and now, as David says, he's in his late 70s. I had the honour to first meet Ilan when I became the national chairman of the British Friends of Israel War Disabled, probably around 20 years ago. At that time, Ilan was the executive director of ZDVF, the Sahal Disabled Veterans Fund, which is a division of Bet Alochem, home to all of Israel's injured war veterans. And Ilan is actually no longer the executive director. He actually resigned in 2013. But between 1996 and 2013, he has literally raised hundreds of millions of dollars for Bet Alochem centers around Israel. And like so many of the people that work at Bet Alochem these days, Ilan had been injured. He lost his lower right arm and hand and was also blind in one eye. But like so many of the veterans, he never spoke about how he was injured 
And I never, ever heard him feeling sorry for himself. And he never, ever complained about his injuries in the many times that, that we mixed and socialized and had meetings uh, talking about the war disabled. Ilan served in the Navy for 25 years. Most of them were spent as a combatant officer in Shayetet 13. Shayetet 13 is a special operations unit of the Israeli Navy, and it specializes in sea to land incursions, counterterrorism, sabotage, maritime intelligence, maritime hostage rescue. The unit is specifically trained for sea, air and land missions and activities. You'll hear more later on, but during the Six Day War, Ilan was captured and held as a prisoner of war in Egypt. He took part in dozens of combat missions, the nature of which to this very day, some cannot be disclosed. He grew up on Kibbutz Kafar Menachem, which is roughly 30 kilometers to the east of Ashkelon. Someone on the kibbutz there had been recruited to serve in Shayetet 13, but was then thrown out of the unit for reasons I don't know. However, when he came back to the kibbutz, he saw Ilan and said to Ilan that when the time comes, that was the unit for him. The day he was eventually drafted, Ilan asked to enlist in the Shayetet. However, his qualifications made him eligible for the Air Force's flight school, and the IDF insisted on sending him to Telnoff Air Force Base to begin his course. At first, at the very first orientation course, the commander stood up and he said, is there anybody here that doesn't want to be here? And Ilan, being Ilan, got up and said he didn't want to be there. His brave stand resulted him in being sent to do kitchen duty at the State of Air Force Base as a punishment. And he worked in the kitchens there for three weeks before he was eventually sent back to the base. However, when he got back to the base, he was told that he was, had been nominated as a candidate for Shayetet. Um, and at that time, nobody really knew much about this particular unit. He wasn't allowed to tell anybody where he was going, what he, where he was serving, what he was gonna do. No one knew anything about the organization. To be accepted into this particular unit, there were no formal qualifications or educational evaluations as there are today. But going back all those years, you had to be tested to see how far you could physically push your body and your mind. There were about 80 or 90 youngsters who were admitted to the training program and they were taken up north to Rosh Hanikra. They were given 20 kilogram backpacks to wear, full army or IDF uh, uniform and a rifle. And they were then told, you're now gonna march from here down to Ashkelon. It's only 180 kilometers. And whoever gets to Ashkelon makes it onto the course. 15 out of the 80 or 90 recruits survived the march, one of whom was Ilan Igozi. The course took about two years to complete. And in Ilan's own words, it was a combination of physical and mental endurance. There's a lot of underwater diving at night in freezing cold water. You go into the Haifa port and dive under boats for three hours. You're on your own. And believe me, there are a good many reasons and excuses you want to get out of there and stop the dive. Your instructor will have every reason to believe you. And there's no way of verifying your story. The following day, the cadet has an even greater physical and mental challenge awaiting him. And to overcome it, one has to be very highly motivated, as it's only this motivation that will push you forward once the physical strength has drained. Beyond the cardinal physical and mental strain, the cadet's personal credibility also plays a key role. You can't be a fighter in the Naval Commando if you haven't got 100% credibility. At the end of the day, you carry out your mission underwater, diving on your own. You need to get to the target. You need to return safely. No one can really check up on you. You have a thousand reasons why not to complete the mission. But if you're not credible, you don't belong in the unit. By the time the Six Day War approached, Ilan was already an officer in his squad and they were sent to dive around the Egyptian port of Alexandria. The Egyptians had blocked the Straits of Tehran and the plan was to reach the port of Alexandria by swimming underwater take advantage of the surprise factor and be the first to act. Ilan's unit's mission was to sink the main part of the Egyptian fleet 
and returned back to Israel before the war kicked off. The group left Israel on a submarine two weeks before the beginning of the Six Day War and the submarine waited in the open sea. They were cut off from, decks, sail from the decks sailing deep under the water and eventually their time came. They dived, they fixed mines to the bottoms of the vessels, but unfortunately they were fixed to supply boats and not to the warships. By the time they'd completed this part of the mission, it was five hours since Elan and his colleagues had left the submarine, and this was way beyond their planned endurance schedule. The navigating equipment that they'd been given that was supposed to guide them was inoperable, and all they were left with was a compass. At dawn's first light, they returned to the rendezvous where the submarine was supposed to have been waiting for them. But when they got there, it wasn't there. There were four Israeli commandos swimming in the open seas in the middle of nowhere and with absolutely no idea what they would do next. They were so confident being Israelis of their success that in actual fact, there was no plan B other than if anything went wrong, they were supposed to spend 24 hours hiding and then go back to the meeting point at sea 24 hours later. Again, quoting Ilan, I know that today it sounds rather absurd, but there we were, four combatants in the middle of the sea, facing an enemy port in the middle of a war, shouting at the top of our lungs. It was years later before Ilan found out that the submarine had actually engaged in battle with an Egyptian destroyer which had detected it beneath the waters and then even launched a torpedo at it, causing it to flee. At the time, Ilan's leadership skills then kicked in. He led the foursome onto a swimmer's beach just south of Alexandria. On the way, they disposed and sank of their diving gear. They found somewhere secure to hide as a temporary measure and Ilan went off to do a recce and to find somewhere that was perhaps more secure where they could hide until they come up with a better idea. He came across a big bunch of rocks and gradually as he moved them between them, he discovered a cave. And as he started moving the rocks to explore the cave, there inside were another two members from his group who had already found the haven in this particular cave hiding from the Egyptians. He brought the other members of his crew back to this cave and between them, they had one canteen of water and some condensed food. They each carried a gun. Just before darkness fell, one of the Egyptian boys who had been playing nearby went across and picked up one of the rocks to throw in the sea. And as he picked up this rock, this young lad playing on the beach discovered six Israeli naval commandos in hiding. They immediately obviously had to debate, what on earth do they do with this boy? But unlike the way that the media portrays the IDF today, they spared his life and they let him go. Within minutes, they were surrounded by Egyptian soldiers who led them away in the direction of some trucks. As they were being marched along the marina, spontaneously, Ilan and one other, uh, one other commando jumped into the water. They hid and remained undetected in the water, underneath boats, underneath jetties, until 3 a.m. the following morning. They then decided to swim in the direction of Alexandria, where they thought international diplomats lived. They thought there might be embassies in Alexandria. Wearing their service uniforms and walking in woolen socks and wearing their dog tags with their uh, num uh, IDF numbers because they didn't want to be caught as spies, they hoped to find asylum at one of the em embassies or in the home of one of the diplomats. They actually started walking around Alexandria, knocking on doors, but to no luck. What they didn't realize was that as they were walking around, they were actually approaching a closed military area where a passerby came up to them and asked them a question. Neither Ilan nor his comrades spoke Arabic and within minutes, they were surrounded by an angry mob wanting to lynch them. The mob had grabbed their diving watches and also their guns, and then they turned the guns on Ilan and his comrade. Fortunately, as luck would have it, having spent so long in the water, the guns didn't work. Seconds later, the Egyptian army arrived 
And effectively, it was the Egyptian army at that stage that saved their lives and prevented the lynching. And Ilan and his comrade were then taken into captivity. It was 40 hours since they'd actually left the submarine. They'd not slept, eaten or drunk anything in that 40 hours. Ilan Igozi was a prisoner of war for nine months, during which time he said he felt that he lost every aspect of his humanity. He also to this very day refuses to answer in detail questions as to the extent to which he was tortured, other than to say, we underwent a lot of torture for the sake of torture. They were merciless, definitely pure sadism, including the use of torture tools, electric shocks to all different parts of the body. Indeed, on one occasion, Ilan was tortured so badly that he, his throat was injured, wounded, he physically couldn't speak. And as he said, the fact that he couldn't speak actually spared him further interrogation and further torture for a few days. Um, and in fact, from that episode, he ended up spending a week in an Egyptian hospital, recovering from his wounds. Eventually, the Red Cross turned up and paid a visit. And that gave Ilan and his comrades new hope. They felt that the Red Cross were now his insurance policy. As it turned out, there were now the six naval commandos, two other Navy soldiers who had been taken prisoner, and two pilots. And for months, the 10 of them lived together in a small room and carried on a kind of daily routine together. Being confined the way they were, they had no idea that the war had ended within six days. And during his captivity, Ilan had actually been told and was repeatedly being told that the Egyptian soldiers had conquered Beersheba and were now on their way close to Tel Aviv. When Ilan was eventually released, after two days, he received a call from his unit, being given an instruction to return to an IDF base. And a day later, he was actually back at his Shayetic unit. Ilan had said that being a prisoner of war had been so humiliating for him, he was desperate to get back to his unit to be able to prove himself again and to restore his own self-esteem and dignity. Thus, he rejoined, he rejoined his own unit around spring 1968. Let me now just fast forward a few months to early 1969 and the war of attrition. The declared Egyptian intention was to wear Israel down by constant ongoing small scale attacks on Israeli positions along the Suez Canal. On the 10th of June 1969, Egyptian commandos made their way across the Suez Canal in dinghies and mounted a bloody attack on the Israeli position at Mezach on the east bank of the Suez Canal. Seven Israeli lives were lost and five were wounded. Others were captured and taken back to Israel, uh, to Egypt, excuse me, as prisoners. The IDF gave the responsibility of retaliation to Flotilla 13, an elite unit of the Israeli Na naval commandos. The IDF general staff demanded a response that would strike at the soul of Egyptian morale and the assault on Mesach had caused, because it had caused the Israeli servicemen posted along the canal to be engulfed by the fear and apprehension. Israel was debating what to do and decided that the most fortified position on the Suez Canal was a place known as Green Island. Green Island was described as a piece of protruding stone and concrete, and the Egyptians considered it an impregnable fortress and symbol of Egyptian military prowess. It was there that the Egyptians felt to be at their safest. Green Island was located at the southern end of the Suez Canal and was built by the British during the Second World War to protect its ultra strategic waterway from air and sea attacks. It was a large imposing facility that measured more than 450 feet long, and more than 240 feet wide. Green Island was highly fortified and manned by about a hundred Egyptian soldiers. They believed that they were unconquerable and Israel was determined to show that they could get anywhere they wanted in Egypt and anywhere that nowhere, excuse me, was safe for Egyptians. In April 1969, before this event took place, a four-man Israeli reconnaissance team had already covertly been to Green Island 
and had come back with a report about the, the structure, where it was, and that it would need at least 40 men to be able to take control of it. The taking of Green Island was a very complex operation. 20 fighters reached the island swimming, in itself an extremely difficult operation and logistical feat, which had never been attempted previously. The fighters were supposed to climb up onto this platform and conquer it. Bear in mind, the water in the region was completely clear. And had the Egyptians noticed the IDF from above, from their island, a couple of hand grenades would have been enough to wipe out all the Israelis. So you can see that the crucial factor on this particular mission was the element of surprise. So what was Ilani Gozi's role in this mission? Well, before I tell you what his role was, there was one, very, one other very, very important fact. Under the terms of the Geneva Convention, there is an obligation to look after and protect your prisoners of war. However, if someone has previously been a prisoner of war and returns to the same country and gets captured again, the protection offered by the Geneva Convention is lifted, it's nullified, and it stipulates clearly that your captures have every right to kill you. Ilani goes, he knew he was returning to Egypt where he'd previously been a prisoner of war. He knew that the protection afforded by the Geneva Convention specifically did not apply to him. But his decision to be an integral part of this mission was never questioned and was never in doubt. Ilani goes, he commanded the break-in squad. For this purpose, he had reconnoitred the island the previous week to inspect the terrain. The plan was that the commandos would climb the fortified island and secure its point of entry. Sayeret Matkal, the special forces men, were to follow in boats, join the break-in force and continue to conquer the island. They reached the island and the break-in team under Ilan's command began cutting the fence to make a, a, a way onto the island itself. However, Ilan tells how he remembers that as they were cutting the wires, he looked up and he could see the guards walking above him, smoking cigarettes, talking. He realized it was impossible for the guards not to notice what they were doing. And that the moment that they saw the Israelis, not only would that have been the end of Ilan Egozi, but it would have also been the end of the forces behind him. Ilan could not physically cut through the fence. And instead he identified a spot from where one could climb onto the island without going through that fence. He told the men behind him that this was to be their new point of entry and assault. So they gave up trying to neutralize the fence and instead they opened fire immediately on the guards. Their incursion onto Green Island had been successful and indeed the whole mission went to plan. But tragically, Israel suffered six fatalities and a number of wounded colleagues as well, some of them from their own stray bullets. The retreat and evacuation of the force from the island was delayed due to the enormous efforts carried out by Ilan and his team to locate some of those who had been injured and those who had been killed. They weren't going home without those fellow soldiers. After the main force had left, Ilan then remained behind with a small force and they laid further explosive devices on Green Island to assist in their getaway. They left the island under a barrage of artillery fired by the Egyptians from the main shore. For his actions at Green Island during this mission, Ilan Gozi was decorated with a Distinguished Service Medal. Let's now fast forward, if we can, just under four years to February 1973. In February 1973, there'd been a terrorist attack in Naharia, in the north of Israel, resulting in the murder of the Haran family. The government of Israel decided it was time to get to the heart of the terrorist command in Tripoli and to take out as many of the terrorist leaders as possible. This was going to be a large scale raid, which included, apart from six naval commando fighters, large paratroop forces. Ilan's job was be, to be the first to arrive on the beaches, to neutralize any threat and secure the beach, while the paratroopers then arrived in their boats from the sea. Afterwards, the group was then to join the paratroopers carrying out the raid as a, fight, as a fighting squad. 
The route leading to the destination was complicated and there was constant fear of being discovered. But despite this, they reached their target unnoticed and in absolute surprise. The raid was carried out exactly as planned and about 80% of the terrorists were killed and wiped out while asleep in their beds. But tragically, it was during this mission that Elani Gozi was seriously injured. He'd led the squad, as I said, and they were clearing the rooms where the terrorists live. They were throwing hand grenades and after the explosion, the force would go into the room, clear out the inhabitants and his force were moving from house to house in the area. One of the houses, a grenade that had been thrown by one of his men hit the iron grids, I guess the, the trissim on the window and rolled back towards Ilan and his men. Someone screamed grenade and Ilan instinctively grabbed it with his hand and tried to throw it away from the direction of his colleagues. The grenade blew up in his hand. He later said that the instinct is to either kick it away or to run away. He was concerned that if he kicked it, it could have gone anywhere and caused more death and destruction. He could have run, but the others would probably have stayed where they were and they would have all been blown up. Trying to throw it seemed the best option. Through his actions, it was recognized that Ilani Gozi had saved the lives of everyone who was close to him in that operation. He saved the lives of his entire squad. Eventually, Ilan was airlifted by helicopter to the Rambam Hospital in Haifa. He lost his hand and his lower right arm. He lost the sight of his eye and he was severely wounded in his leg. But through his bravery, the rest of the squad survived 100% intact and injury free. For his actions in this mission, Ilan Igozi received the Medal of Courage. And what I would like to do, if I may, is just to read the citation to this absolute hero. The Medal of Courage, Major Ilan Egozi. On the night between February the 20th and 21st, 1973, Major Ilan Egozi was serving as the commander of a blocking unit during a Sahal raid on terrorist camps in northern Lebanon. After the target was cleared, the enemy continued firing at the Israeli forces from within houses, which were situated behind the target lines. Major Ilan Egozi was ordered to clear these houses. During the clearing operations, one of the commanding officers ordered a soldier to throw a grenade into a room. The soldier threw the grenade, but it only hit the window grates and came back towards the soldiers. Major Ilani Gozi saw the grenade coming, hurried to pick it up and cast it away from the other men. The grenade exploded while still in his hand and Ilan was severely wounded, losing his right arm and eye. Although he was badly wounded, Ilan ordered the soldier who came to the soldiers who came to care for him to continue in the clearing operation and that they should only come back for him after the mission had been completed. Prior to his injury, Ilan was right-handed. Now he had to learn to be left-handed. Moreover, this had taken part at the beginning of 1973 when the Yom Kippur War arrived some seven months later after his accident Ilani Gozi was back commanding his unit at Sharm El Sheikh, having learned how to use his rifle with one functioning arm and a prosthetic hand. Subsequent to the Yom Kippur War, Ilan continued to lead his troops in various landings and active missions in Lebanon. When Ilan was eventually discharged from the IDF, he was promoted to the rank of Colonel. Hopefully in this presentation this evening, I've demonstrated the dedication that Elana Gozi has to the State of Israel. Hopefully I've demonstrated how on so many occasions Elana Gozi has literally put his life on the line for the benefit of Am Yisrael and for the benefit of the Jewish people world, worldwide. However, at the same time, I think we should all remember that there are, there have been, and there will continue to be thousands more Elana Gozis, each one a hero, each one a giant in his or her own right, who will make the kind of sacrifices we've heard about this evening for the sake of all of us. The Talmud teaches that to save one life is like saving the life of the world. Through the actions and bravery of Ilan Igozi, he literally saved so many Jewish lives. How much more so does that make him a Jewish giant of our times? Thank you. Indeed so, Frank, thank you so much for that. Um, 
there's a, I can see a certain amount of um, clapping here. I don't know if anybody's got any comments, any questions, and there's nothing on the chat. Um, anybody want to uh, contribute? No. Okay. Let's move on. Well, once again, thank you. Thank you, Frank. That was that was brilliant, and I think we've um, we've heard two brilliant talks this evening. Uh, I'm sorry, two, uh, David. I did put my hand up. Um, did you? Yeah. Obviously, you were too late. Sorry. But mine's just a question. Um, you may have... I, I did say. But okay, then go on. Go ahead. Very quick. It's a question. Um, yeah, well, can I ask it. <laughs> I, I, I think Frank knows there was a BFIW committee meeting, so I've missed most of this. Is it recorded? The meeting or this? The whole of the evening. I joined you just ten minutes ago. So was that? The question? Was that the question? <laughs> yeah, that's. The, is it recorded? It says it's recording here on my screen. The recording light is on. How, how is, can I ask for somebody to um, try and let us know if we can download it and listen? Um, I think you need to ask Rabbi Black that. Okay. Okay. Right. Well. All Thank right. you, Frank. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so. Once again, thank you. We've heard, we've heard two great talks this evening, and um, and uh, you know I, I think it's in, in a way it's, it's it's really appropriate that uh, we've ended the short series of talks um, not only in Israel but with um, one of the many uh, war heroes and, and Israeli heroes um, because because I think in a way who, who's still with us. Because I think, in a way, that still dem that demonstrates and illustrates the the strength and the power of Jewish continuity. And um, since this is the last in our series, I just think it's appropriate also just to thank all the contributors: Rabbi Black, Lee, Morris, Rochelle, and Ruth, and of course tonight's uh, contributors, Irene and Frank. I just want to say before we wind up. Um, it speaks volumes, I think, for our community, that not only are we able to produce this sort of series, which is resourced entirely, it's entirely homemade, it's resourced entirely in-house, but not, not only that, but that all the contributors, as far as I'm aware, so please do not disillusion me, well, not in public anyway, um, all the contributors contributed cheerfully and willingly. Um, there may have been some discussion about the person that you were going to talk about, but there was never any doubt that the talks would take place. You know, I think that's a great testament to the vitality of our community and our commitment to it. And now, finally, um, when I broached, that we broached this whole idea you know, months ago now, we also talked about uh, another series, a similar series, maybe after Pesach, only this time, instead of people, it'll be books. Um, you know, we're described as the people of the book. So if anyone has a bee in the bonnet about a Jewish book, please get in touch with me. And it could be a book of Tanakh, could be a Chumash, a Siddur, a Haggadah, book of Halakha, a commentary, could be a novel, could be a series of short stories, could be a book about Israel, a history book, a book about the Holocaust, you know, anything. Only a book which should be, in your view, on every Jewish bookshelf and in every Jewish home. So that said, I think if you'd like to contribute, please let me know and we'll see if we can get a program together, maybe sometime after Pesach. And that's uh, finally, from me, I just know that a few people the afternoon early, um, uh, Murray and Bernard and uh, Priscilla and one or two others, because they're so excited about the U3A class they're having in the morning, they, they want to get to bed early to prepare for it. So I won't keep them any longer. And, uh, I'm so kidding. I'm so kidding. <laughs> 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 thank you david it was brilliant it was brilliant we've learned a lot thank you very much thank you night night everybody oh, well, done. well done well done wonderful thank you very good Irene. very good uh, frank and uh, thank you david well, well done frank <laughs> well Thanks. done david.
and Irene Eagles. Irene, thank and, you. And David. David, David, David well organized. Thank you so much for the trip. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Fascinating stories. Really. Are you there, Frank? Morris? Yeah. What, what book are you thinking of? What's <laughs> that? What book are you thinking of? Because you oh, are. I'm currently looking up the Dead Sea Scrolls. But that wouldn't fit in that one. Book <laughs> and, uh, on your book get that, not everyone can have that on their bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> He's scrolling through them now. As it happens, uh, Danny, as it happens. <laughs> well done, Frank. I'm just going to do, um, if I may, I'm going to do a quick advert. Yeah. I don't know if any of you take the Times. No. In the Times this morning. Daily Star. In the Times <laughs> 2. Times 2. Yes, I'm being serious, if you don't mind. In, time, in Times 2, there's an article about a lady called Yehudis Fletcher. Yeah. Um, who, um, that's that's Yehudis Fletcher. Um, who has um, that got oh, some very transgender. transgender? She's going, she's, she's going, she's not trying to, she's coming to Canton beginning of March. Oh, oh wow, good, not transgender, uh, a, me, a media start, what? Not the transgender, no, chosid. no, not the transgender, what? Chosid. When the, there's a chosid <laughs> and tra transgender. No, her name is Yehuda. No, so. It's um, okay. just, uh, and she's very female. Okay. <laughs> it's just a lady uh, has written to the Home Office about um, forced marriages. That's right. That's right. Oh, okay, right. That's not fine. Okay. It's actually like the Twin Tower. Just between forced yeah. marriage and arranged marriages, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. she's on the um, Twin Tower. She's, uh, she, she, she grew up in Manchester, yeah. I think. She grew up in Glasgow. She's a parent from Manchester, but she grew up in Glasgow. I haven't far found out yet whether she's a City or United supporter. Of course, that will uh, that will affect me. <laughs> we got there before the times. Yeah, we got it before the times. <laughs> anyway, as I say, I don't want to stop Priscilla and uh, Bernard um, Evelyn. and Evelyn, you know, being late for their three class in the morning because we're starting early. <laughs> So, oh, everyone, well, so, keep well, and good night, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting evening. That's me. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, Marlene. Good night, Marlene. Good night, Marlene. Quite late now. Right, finish. Yes, you look who's there. Leave me to say. Yeah. No. Okay. All right, finish. Yes, thank you.